intriguing title, Violence, today. Uh, I'm Henrike Neuhaus, and uh, I will be chairing this session today. And we have two very lovely presenters, um, David Stevens of the University of Nottingham, um, professor at the School of Politics and International Relations. And um, then we do this first presentation, and right next up will be uh, Sari Anani of uh, Göteborg Universität, um, and, and, and a lawyer and barrister as well, practicing, and both, I think, have this inclination to think about the relationship between law and violence and martial arts movement. And with that, I leave the floor to you, <laughs> David. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I'm slightly unnerved by the fact that so many people are attracted to violence, uh, <laughs> which is uh, you know, kind of uh, a strange thing. Um, I, I, I start with a confession. Uh, let me just make a note of the time. I start with a confession. We've got 20 minutes, right? Uh, I, I still feel a bit of an interloper. I came for the first time last year. I'm not a martial arts studies person. I didn't even know the field existed. I saw the conference advertised on the web. I thought, that sounds really cool because I love my martial arts. I'd go along. I had such a fantastic time. I met lots of really, really interesting people really enjoyed the conference and people who said, I'll come next year again. I thought, well, I'd better say something. I wasn't sure I had anything to say. Uh, so I'm back. Um, and, and this talk um, comes from kind of, it's driven by two uh, things really. One is, one is um, kind of a, a lifetime in martial arts, but with, a, with an emphasis or a passion or perhaps a mission on uh, women's self-defense. And the second one is a, is a, a fantastic article by... Um, an Australian philosopher called Gillian Russell um, about um, the relationship between self-defence and violence and the kinds of permissible things that are um, perhaps allowed and not allowed and permissible within self-defence training. So that's kind of where it comes from. I'm a moral philosopher by training, so this would be a, a kind of a, an argument. I'll give you an argument for a position and then hopefully you can tell me why I'm wrong. Um, so... A little bit of background. Uh, some of this may well be familiar to you, uh, but one of the one of the kind of key things about people who train in self-defence that is often talked about is, is um, kind of the, the fighting back moment, right? When it, when it comes to apply the skills in a real event, you know, think of you know some kind of horrific attack, sexual assault, attempted murder, that kind of thing, and. The, the, the kind of the barriers that people face to doing so. One of the most common ones that we hear about all the time, and you may well be aware of, is the adrenal response. You know, people freeze up in the moment, they get that fight, flight, or freeze, they cannot respond. They are just stuck to the floor. Um, and that's because their brains like, usually lack a blueprint for the particular situation that they're facing. And so there are various ways of training to overcome that through a little bit of adrenal exposure, understanding adrenaline, that kind of stuff, what it does to the body, what it does to your performance and so on. Some people don't fight back because when it comes to it, they just don't have the desire to do so. That can be for a number of reasons. Um, sometimes people with very low self-esteem, for whatever reason, when it comes to it, they, can, they, they, they just don't have the heart to fight back. Um, because they don't value themselves perhaps enough. And so a lot of, in particular, women's self-defense, um, we heard a lot about that yesterday as well, it is about raising confidence, raising worth, raising value, um, getting people to see themselves as valuable, uh, and so on. Um, some people just lack the physical skills to, to hurt another person. Right? Even though they have the desire and they're not frozen to the spot, they just can't do enough to, to, to solve. And that's the one thing that most martial arts faith focus on, most self defense systems faith focus on, is that lack of physical skills or capability, trying to make people more skilled at those kinds of, of um, things that would give them a fighting chance in um, a, a genuine self defense situation. There's also another one which, um, which Gillian Russell identifies, and what she calls. Um, the process of violentization. The idea that some people just have, or we all have, but some people have especially high barriers to harming other people. And that's the one I want to focus on today. Because it's the least talked about one, but it raises a really 
or at least I think so, interesting ethical dilemma. Okay. Um, and so I want to just spend a little bit of time fleshing this out. Uh, we can talk about the other ones uh, if, you, if you want to in, in the discussion. They're all really interesting. So on one theory, a psychological theory, it's often called the barrier theory of evil, we all pretty much, most of us, have a natural aversion to harming other human beings. Some people don't. Right? Some people seem to be born without that, some sort of sociopathy. Other people have lost it, perhaps through trauma or other things, um, such that it's been lowered, and their response then to lots of situations is to be violent, right? or to use violence to leverage others. But for the vast majority, when we see real violence, not sporting violence, real, real violence, it creates a kind of visceral reaction, we recall from it. Right? We, 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 we shy away from it, we kind of turn sideways and not really want to look. That's a normal motivation within humans. Therefore, for many people, violence is not what we might call a live option. It's not something that's on the table all the time for every situation, from a fender bender all the way through to you know, fighting for your life in a, in a violent attack. Um, and this is often called the violence inhibis inhibition mechanism. We have this mechanism which just stops us from being violent in kind of normal social situations. We just don't think about it. It's not something that we would consider to, as an option. And in many ways that's great, right? That, that's what makes the vast majority of people sociable and able to get on in a reciprocal fashion. But it does pose a problem for, for some who, when called upon to defend their own lives or, or their, their life from serious physical harm, cannot bring themselves to fight back. They just cannot step over, if you want, that barrier, that violence inhibition barrier. It might be a little bit more raised than other people's or it might be just set up a high level anyway. And this has been a, a problem for, or a problem that many kind of reality-based self-defense systems have, have, have uh, considered along with the fear factor as well. And Russell, Julian Russell points this out. So there are a number of training methodologies that are deliberately designed to lower that barrier. We can talk about what they are, but one of the main ones is, is kind of scenario-based replication. You put people into a scenario that will be as close as we can make safely in a kind of a, a, a mock situation, like the eventuality that they're preparing for, such that when you encourage them to fight back, you encourage them to do what it's necessary for them to do, they get a exposure to that confidence of doing it, but it also, when, if, if and when that ever happens, they're not so inhibited about doing what they have to do because they've done it already, albeit in a mock situation which the brain kind of recognises as real. And so there are tactics and techniques, and some of them are quite extreme, others are not so extreme, uh, for, lowering, for lowering that barrier. And, and many martial arts, uh, we talked about fast defense and modern mugging earlier, whoever it was I was speaking to about that, uh, that, that has some of that in it, lowering that barrier to, to, to fighting back. Now, that can be a problem. Here's the ethical rub about this. It puts violence on the table for people for whom it wasn't previously on the table, as an option, as a live option. Okay? We're not talking about you know, people who already have bad motives. We're talking about decent people who are worried about their own safety, but perhaps would never harm another human being. I just couldn't bring myself to do that. Now having that option. And the worry is, Russell's worry is that that, that might make some people more likely to respond with violence when it's not appropriate, in situations when it's not appropriate. An argument over a place in a supermarket a fender bender on the road, whereas before they would never have even thought of lashing out, but now it becomes a, 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 a possibility, even though they don't have the intention to harm other people, it's just an option. And so they would have to struggle against that, just like if you're a lover of junk food and you're on a diet, and you have to struggle against that desire, or that option of going to McDonald's and eating junk food. So Russell's worry is that such training comes at a cost. It comes at a cost. It comes at probably at lots of costs. It comes at a cost to the characters of the individuals doing it. Maybe you, now you have a slightly more vicious character. 
Right? Maybe it comes at a cost of real kind of tangible things, like you know, if you lash out at someone in a situation where it's not justified, then you're going to face the consequences of your actions. But thirdly, it imposes a cost on other people, innocent third parties, that person in the supermarket queue, who would never have been subjected to the risk of violence had you not taken that train. So it imposes a cost for your benefit, you're now better able to defend yourself against a violent attack. It imposes the cost not on you for that necessary, maybe partly, but on the co- that one, it imposes that cost on other people who may now be the victim of your physical actions, if this view is correct. And it's that bit, that cost for third parties, that I'm going to focus on in the last 10 minutes. So the question is, is it morally permissible to train to lower one's violence inhibitor mechanism for the purpose of self-defense if those costs may be borne by some innocent third parties? And my answer in typical philosopher fashion is going to be, yeah, kind of, sort of, with a few bells and whistles um, stuck on it. Um, So two possible answers, just a little bit of ground clearing. One, One answer is just to say, well, martial arts create good people. They don't create bad people. Sometimes bad people come to martial arts, but by and large, you take people, you give them skill set, they don't want to fight. It's the Miss and Yagi thing. Why are you taking crime? Yeah, because I want to fight. No, because you don't want to fight. Right? And that may be true. That's an empirical claim. You can measure that. You know, what the outcomes, I think Alex is uh, here uh, this week, has done some of that kind of stuff. I don't know much about kind of quantitative stuff, so I'm going to leave that aside. But it strikes me that and there may be some sort of though, I'm not aware of any. Uh, martial, arts, martial artists are not particularly more moral people than any other cross-section of the, of, the, of the population. But even if it were true that one person were more likely to use violence in a non-appropriate situation, we would have a case to worry about, at least in principle. I think there's a better normative response, or I think there's a normative response we can give. So I'm going to accept that, that, that Russell's argument is true for the sake of the argument, in arguendo. Uh, a different response might be to say, well, look, by some people training in these kind of martial arts, they're less likely to be the subject or the victims of real violence, terrible violence. And yes, this may have some costs, you know, some may lash out in some situations where they otherwise would not have done, but overall, the net gain is much, much greater. Societies will be far less violent if people take self-defense training that has this kind of component to it. And that's a kind of an odd view. I think that's mistaken because it's an aggregative view. It says, well, yeah, it's okay if, some, if you create some violence so long as overall the amount of violence goes down. And that's a very odd way to view the right to self-defense. Right? It's, it's like saying to a victim of crime, ah, Sorry you're a victim of a crime, but it's okay because lots of other people are. Their response will be to say, well, okay for who? Right? Not for me. It's no good that someone's passed that cost on to me. But it gives me a, a way into the argument that I want to make. With, oh, sorry. Um, now what do I do? Uh, I think we can just click at the bottom. Oh, okay. Okay, um, so so some might say, well, it's not it's not better for me that there's less violence. I'm now the victim of violence I wouldn't otherwise have been. <coughs> it's also that aggregate response, that kind of summing of harms and, and benefits, uh, sort of evening them out, is out of line with what most of us and most jurisdictions, I'm not necessarily talking about legal jurisdictions, think about what self-defence is. What is self-defense as a justification, as a, as, a, as a claim when we have to explain our actions to someone? Why did you hit that person? Why did you strike them? Why did you throw them to the floor? Well, I was acting in self-defense. And our intuitions about that, I think, are, 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 fairly, are fairly set. Right? Self-defense, the claim of self-defense, or the defense of self-defense, either in legal or moral terms, is a, is a form of exculpation, something that removes guilt. And exculpatory reasons are of two forms. They're excuses or they're justifications. When someone says, why did you do that? You've really got an excuse or a justification to remove your guilt, if you have one or the other. 
An excuse says, look, I did the thing, it was a bad thing to do, but I had to do it. I was forced into doing it. Why did you rob the bank and, and threaten the bank clerk? Well, I know it was wrong, but they held my family hostage, and if I didn't do that, then they were going to harm my family. Right? Well, it was still a wrong thing to do, but we understand why you might have done that. Right? Why did you eat the cabin boy? A very famous legal case of Britain. Right? They had the cabin boy because they thought they were going to die at sea. Right? They, 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 they'd been shipwrecked, and, and, and they didn't have any food, so they had the cabin boy. It's right? still a wrong thing to do. But we understand in those desperate situations why someone might have done it. What's a justification? Justification is a stronger form of exculpation. It says, yeah, I did hit them. I have, I have full responsibility for that. But what I did was not wrong, it was actually right. A justification flips right and wrong. So something that's ordinarily wrong is rendered correct, morally justified, legally justified in these circumstances. And self-defense, at least as most of us understand it, is that kind of defense. It doesn't say, look, you know, oh yeah, I did the wrong thing. I need to apologize to the person or make compensation. No, 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 I owe them no apology. I may regret that it came to that situation, but I owe them no apology, no compensation for the harm that I committed in defending my life against an attack. And so, self-defense transforms what would ordinarily be wrong, harming another human being, under certain circumstances, into the morally and legally right thing to do. If it were merely an excuse, then we would owe things like um, compensation to victims to the extent that we were responsible for it. But rather, it's the right thing to do. And this understanding also grounds, also explains another kind of deeper level, uh, what I might call meta-ethical, position better than the alternative view, which is where does self-defense come from? What grounds this idea of a right to self-defense? Why do we have this right to self-defense? And the usual story in moral philosophy is it, it comes from the right to life that we all have, the right not to have our lives taken away from us arbitrarily. And if someone does try to take away our life arbitrarily or to cause serious harm, then two things happen. One is I can seek to maintain my life. And the other one is that the person who tries to take it away unjustifiably forfeits theirs temporarily. So that if I end up harming them or killing them in a self-defense situation, then I do nothing wrong. I don't violate, violate their right to life because they forfeited it temporarily. If the view that I'm arguing against were correct, then we would have to say, no, no, in self-defense situations, no one loses their right to life. And basically what we have to do is we have to work out which loss of life would be the lesser of two evils. And that's a very odd view to have about self-defense because that would mean that in principle we would have to work out how much people are worth in comparison with each other. What good could this person do in the world or have they done? What would their loss mean and so on? That would be a very strange view to have about what self-defense is. So... If we have this right, if my argument so far is correct, then there's a, another step I need to make, which is, if we've got a right, then we have to have the means to exercise it. Otherwise, it's a hollow right, an empty right. How am I doing for time? Two minutes. Otherwise, it's an empty right. Um, so we need the means. If, you can't, if you've got the right to go to the opera, but you've got no money, then it's an empty right. We have to give it its fair value. So we have to have the opportunity to be able to exercise that right. Some people cannot bring themselves to be violent in response to a, a attack, unprovoked attack, then they should have the opportunity for the training that would allow them to do that to fulfill their right to life, their right to self-defense. That establishes a prima facie case for that right to self-defense. Now, someone might say, okay, but the costs of doing that are just so high. They're so high that having that right to self-defense would rule out certain things. I think this is Russell's position. But it increases the cost to third parties so much that we should stop people from having that option of certain kinds of training to lower the barriers. And, we, and they haven't consented, those third parties haven't consented. And that's often a, an argument that's made about 
gun ownership. Right? The, you know, the, 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 the third party cost to gun ownership is so high, innocent deaths through guns, that it, it means there's a, there's a blanket prohibition on anyone having gun ownership. Um, and so, to kind of bring things to an end, right? how might I answer this question? Well, that gun ownership is one extreme. Generally, though, we think that passing on some costs to third parties are okay. When I drive to work every morning, I impose a risk on everyone around me. Not because I'm a bad driver, it's just the nature of driving. And so does everyone else. They impose a risk when they're on the roads. But we think that's a reasonable risk to impose, one that we share in a reciprocal fashion. We may be the victim of a road traffic accident, but it allows us to live normal lives within the context in which we live. It's reciprocal and it's reasonable. And my argument is that that's true of self-defense training as well. And therefore, self-defense training is not like gun ownership because it doesn't have the same massive consequences. Right? Um, I'll skip this slide, actually, uh, as I'm running out of time. Um, that it's not like gun ownership. Um, Self-defense just doesn't have the same repercussions as gun ownership. Right? You don't hear stories of, of, of martial artists running rampant with their fists in schools. Right? And even if they did, right, the level of damage on average that they would do would be far, far less than gun ownership. Right? And so the, the kind of damage limitation and so on means that it is it, the, the costs of, that we share from having self-defense training is far, far lower than something that that is much, much higher. Now that's a threshold view. Obviously, if it were true that so many people were taking self-defense training and being really, really violent, then that threshold would perhaps be surpassed. We'd have to say, no, we need to take another look at that. And we might say the same about gun ownership in some societies. We might say that, yeah, the cost of gun ownership is very high on third parties, but the cost of not having gun ownership in some societies is so high that it outweighs that. But that's a downstream decision from the right to self-defense. I hope that makes sense and I'll leave things there for you and I'll clear up anything else in the, in the questions and answers. Thank you.